Well, the next uh, speakers, I'm not going to introduce them. I'll let them say a few words about themselves, but I'm going to introduce the topic, which is about um, anionic polyacrylamides, or PAM. And PAM, these, these uh, are important chemical additives used in treatment of fine tailings. And so industry and other stakeholders were interested in identifying potential knowledge gaps related to environmental or human health impacts of anionic PAM-treated fine tailings. So this is work that happened in the tailings EPA, but it's relevant for uh, the water um, issue. Um, and so this work was undertaken to leverage, there's a large body of existing literature um, to inform on relative chemical, toxicological and degradation mechanisms that could be expected in PAM treated tailings, deposits and closure landforms. And so uh, the results of that report are going to be shared by Jerry and Bart here today and I think the report is also available on the COSIA website if you'd like more details after the presentation. So take it away gentlemen. We're good to go. Yep. Okay, good morning and uh, thanks for having us. My name is Bart Koppa. I'm with Intrinsic and I'm here with Jerry Vandenberg. So, I don't know if we can go straight into it. So, we were commissioned, so co-funded by Alberta Innovates and, and COSIA to do a deeper dive into polyacrylamides and oil sands tailings and, and to try to answer the question whether or not these products are safe to use. Um, just to give you a quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today, Jerry's gonna be doing most of the heavy lifting. I'll jump in a couple of times to talk about some topics that are near and dear to my heart. But just to frame the issue for us, um, you know, both Jerry and I and, and others in our organization have, have worked on, on oil sands applications over the last 20 years. And this is a, an issue that comes up on a regular basis, this question as to whether or not the use of PAM and potentially the eventual breakdown of PAM could pose not just a risk to environmental, uh, env environmental health, but to human health as well. So we've had a lot of SOCs over the years, SIRs on this topic. And really with this literature review, we are trying to kind of try to put, uh, to close the case on this, but, but we'll see whether or not we actually got to that uh, towards the end of the, uh, the presentation. So the question ultimately is whether or not PAM is safe for use. And, and, and the way that we contextualize this or we frame it is by seeing whether or not there are uh, potential or relevant exposure pathways that could link a source to a receptor. So it could be an ecological receptor or it could be human health as well. Um, and then ultimately, if there is, if that potential does exist, um, then we need to make some determination whether or not PAM or its byproducts are toxic and to what extent are they toxic. So to give you a quick overview of what we're talking about, um, Jerry will talk a little bit about the chemistry of PAM, the, the use of PAM. Uh, we'll talk about the breakdown of PAM. I'll talk a little bit about what the, what the environmental fate is of PAM and its byproducts, whether or not there is a potential for exposure. Then I'll talk a little bit about the toxicity, throw it back over to Jerry and he'll talk about the environmental consequences of the use of PAM. And then we'll talk to you about our key findings. There we go. Okay, thanks. Um, so, I mean, probably a lot of people here are familiar with polyacrylamide, but I'll just start with the basics briefly. Uh, so what is it? It's a uh, polymeric flocculant. It's a uh, polymer that's made up of many small components of acrylamide. And so the, the structure for polyacrylamide is shown on the bottom here. These are extremely large, so 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 grams per mole. Uh, I should mention we're only dealing with anionic polyacrylamide. There are other formulations that are used, uh, but they're not used very much because the anionic is known to be lower toxicity. Uh, so our, our scope is limited to anionic uh, polyacrylamide. Uh, but essentially what they do is they separate solids from water, and this works whether there is a water stream with a small amount of particles, like a drinking water, for example. Uh, polyacrylamides are used a lot for removal of solids in the drinking water industry or if there's a stream with heavy solids, it's, it, it still works on the same principle. So tailings and sludges are brought together by the polyacrylamide molecule, which bridges the gap, uh, helps overcome electrostatic repulsion, brings the particles together, and basically either lets the particles settle out more quickly or it expels the water from the pores. Uh, but either way, it's separating water from solids and it's used in many different applications. <clears throat> 
So the, the application where it's been used the most historically is agriculture. It's been applied to fields to limit erosion, uh, to limit the amount of loss of water, uh, to reduce nutrient uh, application. Uh, it's highly beneficial in the agricultural field and of course because it's being applied where our food is grown, it's been studied quite heavily over the past three decades in that industry. Uh, so a lot of the literature that uh, we reviewed comes from the agricultural setting. It's also been used a lot in water treatment, so of course it's being added to water that we drink, so it's been studied quite heavily there. Uh, it's also used in many other industries. I've listed a few of them here. Um, during, the, uh, during the time we did this literature review, I set up a Google alert just to see what sort of literature is being generated. And almost every day I got more than the 10 results and I got the little would you like to see more? But I mean, there is a lot of literature on polyacrylamide. It's used everywhere. I am quite sure all of us have some polyacrylamide on our bodies right now from some source or another. Uh, but it is, it is kind of, it's, it's, it's used a lot. But, but primarily what I'll be talking about is the applications where it's either been applied to agriculture or water or something uh, fairly analogous to oil sands tailings. That's where we focused our, our literature review. And so this is just one example of how it's used. Uh, each operation uses it slightly differently. According to the tailings plans that we read a year or two ago, each operation was either using it at a pilot or demonstration or full scale. Uh, so the key point here is that the flocculant is added in, uh, into the slurry uh, using some sort of a mixer fairly close to the time when it's deposited. So that's really where our source and our conceptual model of the source pathway receptor starts is, is that source is the polyacrylamide that's added in a tailing stream uh, shortly before being deposited. And you can see the figure on the right, it shows sort of two different states that it can be deposited in. It can be deposited as a wet landscape or a dry landscape. Uh, and there might be some other variation to that being planned, but those are broadly the two different uh, end, end points of, of tailings that have been amended with polyacrylamide. So under a water cap or in a dry stack and probably with some other cover on top, but generally it's, it's just a wet or a dry system. And then this is just another example as well. They don't all look like this, but just to kind of get a feel for what this looks like. This is a, an example from Syncrude uh, and this is how the, the polymer is added and mixed and then it's deposited into a cell. Of course, at the full scale, the cells will be much larger than this, but just to kind of get a view of what, what's happening. So we had sort of a side scope and at, at, the, uh, at the start of this project, this seemed like um, it was going to be sort of its own little topic, which is the analytical methods around polyacrylamide. But this ended up being really relevant to some of the other uh, areas that we looked at, like decay rates, and I'll come back to that. But just uh, to set that up, uh, there are lots of different analytical methods for polyacrylamide. Uh, none of them are standard or commercially available. Uh, and the reasons are is that there's lots of different sizes and types of polyacrylamide, so there is no one single compound. Uh, the, there are a lot of challenges with the analytical methods, namely that the polyacrylamide is strongly adsorbed onto the particles. And so to extract the polyacrylamide, it's, it's a difficult thing to do without changing the compounds. And then we have that complex matrix of the oil sands tailings, which adds to the difficulties. Um, so there, there were no standard methods. Uh, there are lots of different methods that have been, been applied, but keep in mind when we talk about the different uh, decay rates and decay mechanisms, a lot of the studies are measuring different things. Some of them are measuring the generation of byproducts. Some of them are measuring uh, some of the compounds themselves, but they all sort of come up with a slightly different answer. Um, so we focused quite a bit on degradation and because you know, the analogy was, uh, it, you know, in a fairly straightforward way of looking at polyacrylamide, if you think of acrylamide as, as the Lego piece, you put it together and you take 100,000 of those and you build a Millennium Falcon or something like that. You've got this giant molecule, you drop it on the floor, and you're going to end up with lots of Lego pieces. And so that, that was sort of my original conception of that, but because the degradation pathways are completely different from how the molecules put together. What you end up with is either large chunks of Lego or little fragments of a single piece, but no individual pieces. So in other words, there are no degradation pathways that lead back to acrylamide, but you do get some different products. 
Uh, broadly speaking, the, the degradation pathways either follow uh, deamination, which is removal of the nitrogen functional group, and that is by far the most common degradation pathway, or chain scission, which is breaking up that long backbone, which can occur under some circumstances, but it's quite limited. So looking at the biological pathway, this is one example. It's quite complex. You do get a lot of byproducts. Uh, we did screen the byproducts against uh, any sort of toxicological thresholds or, or known toxicity benchmarks, but uh, we didn't see any, any uh, byproducts of any risk to, the, to humans or the environment. So you, you do end up with quite a, a large suite of different small chemicals. Most of them are fairly biodegradable. Uh, so this is, this is the biological pathway. There are other degradation mechanisms. Uh, so photodegradation, we sort of looked at these as whether or not these would be relevant to our, our transport and, and fate mechanisms. In terms of photodegradation, we thought this one would, might be interesting and worth looking at in a dry stack uh, if, if tailings are deposited at that surface. There's some potential for photodegradation to occur. Um, the key there would be to cover that material as, as soon as, as possible, either with another layer of tailings or with, uh, with some sort of a reclamation material. Uh, if it is an issue at all, we're not basically not saying that we expect to see a lot of photodegradation, but it's something that we couldn't say, you know, rule out as part of the literature review. So probably something worth monitoring. Uh, mechanical degradation was interesting. So that is a, it, it is a big issue if the, if the tailings or other materials are mixed too, with too much turbulence, it can actually break apart the polymer. Uh, but in looking into how this is done, we understand that the tailings are actually mixed. That it's, it's, there's a lot of engineering that goes into getting the amount of turbulence just right. And so if that is done, you would expect to see very minimal mechanical degradation in the tailings. And then thermal degradation has been observed in some settings like the oil production uh, applications, but this is at hundreds of degrees Celsius only. We didn't find any examples of thermal degradation uh, in, in systems that are analogous to an oil sands tailings deposit. Uh, there have been three studies uh, looking at oil sands tailings. I think they're all, at, yeah, they're all at the U of A. Um, and none of them were specifically looking for acrylamide, uh, but they were really just looking at the mechanisms of the breakdown. Uh, they were looking at whether it could be used as a nitrogen source or a carbon source. And this is a, sort of a common question in the, in the literature of polyacrylamide breakdown. How, how, um, how, are they breaking, how are the microbes breaking down the polyacrylamide? Are they, are they deaminating it and removing that nitrogen group or are they going for chain scission? And of course, what happens is uh, they won't do either until either the nitrogen or the carbon is depleted. Uh, so in, in terms of degradation in an oil sands tailings, you would expect to see none in the fresh tailings uh, because there's generally sufficient nitrogen and carbon to generate that biomass. Uh, so what they do in the microcosms in all three of these studies, they've all used slightly different methods, but essentially what they do is they run multiple microcosms and either add or subtract the carbon and nitrogen, either through dilution or additions, and uh, have multiple replicates, some with controls that have had the microbes killed, some that have had microbes added from different um, methanogenic systems, but really trying to get at whether or not the carbon or the nitrogen or both can be used as a, as a source for the microbes. So the first study in 2005 was using Syncrude MFT with some mature fine tailings and thickened tailings, and they concluded that microbes were able to use polyacrylamide as a source of nitrogen, but not carbon. So in other words, they could deaminate it, but not uh, undergo chain scission. And in the second two studies, they concluded that the microbes did not metabolize the polyacrylamide, nitrogen, or carbon. And there's actually a little bit of a commentary in the Collins paper looking back at all the different factors that could have uh, given them different results from the 2005 study. Um, there were lots of different factors that were different, not just their study methods, but um, the amount of nitrogen in the syncrude uh, uh, OSPW versus the Albion Muskeg River Mine OSPW, which was in the uh, second two papers, was a big factor. Um, the microbial communities, uh, there were just lots of different factors. And what really stood out to me, this was a bit of a key finding for me personally, is that um, looking at the microcosm or other studies from one tailings deposits, you have to be really careful about generalizing 
to other tailings deposits. So there's probably lots of processes that it doesn't matter one tailings is the same as the other, but particularly in this case, there was, there was to me, it seemed pretty clear that if you, if you wanna look at this particular issue, it would be best to use your own tailings and not just rely on some other um, operations because there's too many factors that can't be controlled for. Um, so trying to understand the degradation factors that of course would help us if we want to control or limit the degradation. Uh, so we looked at what are the factors that drive it and what would increase or decrease the rate of degradation. So in terms of the formulation, the larger the molecule, the more difficult it, it was or the slower it would degrade. Uh, in terms of microbial communities, uh, uh, the, the deamination requires a bacterial community which is virtually present everywhere. There's lots of different uh, microbes that can do this. And so that is probably never gonna be a limiting factor. But in terms of the chain scission, it actually probably is a limiting factor because they require, as far as we can tell, some type of a, a white, white rot fungi that may or not be present in oil sands tailings. So that was, it was kind of interesting. Um, in terms of pH, they like a neutral pH range. Uh, temperature, of course, just like a lot of other biochemical processes, it increases with increasing temperature up to a certain limit. And then redox, which is a, which is a big factor because that comes back to the dry versus wet tailings. Uh, so the aerobic environments produced much faster degradation, probably not a big surprise. The anaerobic or the anoxic conditions uh, really limited the degradation, particularly the, the chain scission. So the, if, if the polyacrylamide is deaminated, you, you're, you're left with a large polyacrylate um, molecule. And under aerobic conditions, it was rare that that would, would break down through chain scission. Um, so this is just one example of some of the decay rates we found. This is about a three or four page long table. And the reason I'm showing it is just to kind of give an, an example of how all these different rates have been measured by different groups and on different compounds. Uh, so we end up with different endpoints that they're measuring, that we end up with different uh, information from each one of these. And so at the start, I was kind of hoping that we could come up with some sort of a decay rate that we could use to predict uh, polyacrylamide degradation. But my conclusion here was that there's no way uh, that can be done in any sort of a generalizable way. So possibly if somebody wanted to know a degradation rate in a specific tailings compound with a specific polyacrylamide compound with specific bacteria present, that might be, pre that might be possible, but uh, I don't see any way of taking what's in the literature and, and, and coming up with some sort of a rate of degradation that could be applied generally. Uh, so just to kind of reiterate the key findings, so this isn't the, the full key findings from the paper, but just, just in terms of the degradation. So the microbes degrade PAM to use nitrogen under anaerobic and aerobic environments. Uh, but they only use uh, PAM as a carbon source under very limited circumstances. So that, that backbone is, is quite recalcitrant. Um, now that's, uh, I, the caveat there is that that's a short-term finding. So there hasn't been any multi-decade studies or anything like that. And looking back at some of the earlier studies around methane generation in the tailings pond, it did, it did take uh, 10 to 20 years in some ponds for methanogenesis to kick in, which is a function of you know, the depletion of certain compounds and the, um, the shifting to different uh, microbial communities. And so over, over decades or centuries, that's theoretically possible here. Uh, we can't rule that out, but uh, it seems unlikely just based on the conditions that are there that, that one day we'll see a, a large amount of degradation and in, in, uh, in consumption of these large molecules by, by microbes. Uh, one of the key findings is that acrylamide was not a detectable byproduct of polyacrylamide degradation in any of the many uh, hundreds of studies that we reviewed, mainly from agriculture, but again from, from those other uh, industries as well. And most of the agricultural studies, especially the early studies, were specifically looking for acrylamide because that was also the same concern in their, in their industry as well. Now the one, uh, again, caveat to that is that there is generally some residual acrylamide in the, in the commercial formulation. So when, when a company buys polyacrylamide, there's almost always a small trace amount of acrylamide left there. So that's something that should be, should be measured and should be checked with the manufacturers that they, they go below a certain limit. And so I don't believe there are any limits on that in Canada. There's a food packaging limit in, in Europe, for example, uh, 
when polyacrylamide is used for food packaging, the residual acrylamide has to be less than half a percent of the original formulation. So there are some guidelines, but none that are especially uh, applicable here. Uh, and then in terms of the products formed, so the first one we would see is, is some nitrogen compound uh, that would probably be taken up in cell biomass, but it could be degraded again. Uh, but we'd, we would expect to see, if the polymers are degrading, we would expect to see a, a signal of nitrogen and then some lower molecular weight polymers, so polyacrylate and, or some fraction of that, and then volatile fatty acids. Those would be the main products we would expect to see. Uh, and, and those are pretty consistent in all the different fields. It's, it's relatively the same sort of uh, process. And I think I'm gonna turn it back to Bart for a minute. So, so based on, on what we discovered and, and what Jerry just talked about, we wanted to look at the environmental transport and exposure for certain, for not only PAM itself and polyacrylate, but also the byproducts or potential byproducts. So we looked at PAM, we knew that it was, it, it binds really strongly to the tailing. So it's not really expected to travel anywhere, but there's still some question mark with respect to dust. We know that dust is, is, is an issue at some of the oil sands operations. And we wondered whether or not there's an opportunity for PAM to be carried off site as it was bound to the dust. Um, I mean, it, it remains a question mark because, you know, in theory as well, like PAM can be pretty effective as being a, a soil conditioner, so it can actually, you know, theoretically reduce uh, the production of dust. But that's something that we wanted to explore. As well, when we looked at acrylamide and acrylic acid, we knew that, yeah, it's, it's more mobile in soil and groundwater, but we thought that that would be limited by, by the rate of biodegradation, because that's the dominant factor that would ultimately affect its fate in the environment. Uh, but then, and Jerry just mentioned this, this idea of that you've got, you could have trace amounts of acrylamide in, in some of these commercial formulations. It could be somewhere between 0.1 or 0.05%. So there's some question whether or not acrylamide could be present shortly after that PAM was used or just, just uh, in the recently placed deposits. And then with ammonia, we know that it's mobile in groundwater. We, we know how ammonia travels through the environment. Uh, so there aren't too many question marks related to that. So I've got two slides that just kind of walk you through a conceptual exposure model, both for PAM and then for ammonia. So this gives you an idea as to what we were looking at and what exposure pathways we were trying to identify as being potentially operable or open. Um, so starting at the PAM treated tailings, we looked at a different exposure media. So we looked at surface water sediment, all the dotted lines that you see, and then the ultimate connections to the exposure pathways and the potential receptors all the way to the right. The dotted lines means that it's an incomplete pathway. So that there's essentially either limited opportunity for exposure or no opportunity for exposure at all. And then those solid lines where they connect dust deposition into surface water or dust generation all the way at the bottom to fugitive dust and then potentially to the inhalation of dust. That's a potentially operable or open pathway that need, may need to be explored um, going forward. Then when we looked at ammonia, you see obviously that there's a lot more solid lines. So for this conceptual exposure model, we know that there's an opportunity like a theoretically an opportunity for exposure. We know that ammonia is well studied, it's well monitored as well. So, you know, eventually we ended up making some recommendations with respect to ammonia. But this again, it links that starting point, the source, looking at different environmental media, exposure media, all the way through the exposure pathways to the potential receptors. And we see potentially relevant exposure pathways would include ingestion of surface water, both um, as drinking water or incidental, and then dermal contact with surface water, and then also dermal contact with soil. We also start to look into the toxicity of the different compounds. We, we know that for PAM and for polyacrylate, that it exhibits low toxicity um, to both aquatic and mammalian systems. We also noted that there's really no environmental quality guidelines available for PAM, but I think it's just generally acknowledged that PAM or anionic PAM is, is not very toxic, it's inert. It's a different story when you're looking at the positively charged PAM, which is not what we're looking at here because that is potentially toxic to, to uh, aquatic life because it has a tendency to bind to gills, not the case of, of the PAM that we're looking at here. Acrylamide and acrylic acid, we know more about the toxicity of those compounds. There are soil and surface water gu guidelines 
available only for the protection of human health, not for environmental health. Um, and I know as well that the US EPA has looked into this and they offer toxicological reference values or reference doses. They also have a, a risk specific dose for, for potential carcinogenic endpoint. All of that was considered as part of our literature review. And then ammonia, like I said, we know lots about, so it didn't, uh, we didn't need to do too much digging into that. Back to Jerry. Okay, and again, this was uh, almost like a little carve out from our study. This is the non-toxicological consequences. So this was, for me, kind of one of the more interesting areas because it's sort of like looking at all the different possible things that could happen and trying to understand if any of them are actually relevant. So carbon and nitrogen enrichment. So uh, aside from any toxicological uh, issues, would we expect to be uh, adding nutrients to our environment and maybe causing eutrophication or something? So we might see a small increase in nitrogen. The, uh, the area has a lot of nitrogen already, both in the, in, the, in the process materials and naturally it's fairly high nitrogen environment. So we might see small increases. It might be detectable. I'm not really sure. Uh, this is just getting into speculation, but it, I think it does provide some useful monitoring because if, if, you, if you are going to see any sort of degradation byproduct, this is probably the first one you would see. So it's just, uh, we're not uh, expecting this to be a large environmental impact or anything, but possibly, you know, just something that could be measured um, as an indicator. Change in pH, we looked at this because these are some redox reactions, we're exchanging protons, and we wanted to understand whether there was any risk to either acidify or uh, provide too much alkalinity and sort of shift the ecosystem, but this seemed very unlikely just based on the amount of change in pH in lab studies. And then we looked at the issue of greenhouse gas generation. So in other words, could these polyacrylate compounds be further broken down all the way to carbon dioxide or methane and produce large amounts of greenhouse gases? Probably not. Uh, this process would be extraordinarily small and slow. So this doesn't really seem like a legitimate risk, uh, even over the long term. Uh, despite that, so we did mention a couple of things that we, we said we couldn't really rule out the risk. We don't really feel they're particularly high risk, but nonetheless uh, would recommend doing some monitoring to be sure. So the residual acrylamide in fresh tailings, that's the amount of acrylamide that comes from the manufacturer that is still present. We would expect that to be degraded fairly rapidly. Unlike polyacrylamide, the monomer acrylamide is actually a fairly well-known compound and can be fairly reliably, reliably predicted in terms of degradation. It is very quick, and so we would expect to see within days or weeks most or all of the acrylamide gone if there was some there, but definitely worth monitoring. And then fugitive dust around dry tailings. Again, uh, we would expect that there would be far less dust from any landform that has polyacrylamide in it, but without monitoring data, it's, hard, it's really hard to say that and then any ammonia in seepage or runoff, particularly in, in, uh, in the aging uh, deposit. Uh, key findings, was that you or me? I think that was you. Oh, okay, I'll take it. Okay, so polyacrylamide is generally safe. Uh, we don't expect the, the polymer itself to migrate at all. It's very, very strongly bound to the matrix. This is a very consistent finding from particularly the, ag the agricultural field. And then degradation is likely to be slow, if at all, in terms of the, the large polymer itself. Uh, we've made a couple of monitoring recommendations, which I won't repeat since I just went over them, but uh, I think they're fairly straightforward and would really, in, in my mind, answer any remaining questions around polyacrylamide. Um, so I do want to really acknowledge some of the people that spent a lot of time with us. Uh, they were really passionate and, uh, and extraordinarily helpful, giving up their time to kind of walk us through where we were sort of butting up against the edge of our expertise. So these, all the people listed here spent uh, a lot of really, really helpful time with us. Of course, we want to thank uh, Alberta Innovates and COSIA for funding this. It was a really interesting thing to work on. So really appreciate everybody listed here. Thank you. So we've got time for a few questions. Um, yeah, the first question is about dust and didn't you find information about dust from the ag sector? Wouldn't that have been studied already? Um, so only to the extent that it was clear that polyacrylamide is really good at re reducing dust, but not in actually measuring the dust and speciating it and trying to 
understand the, uh, the composition of the dust. We didn't come across any of that. Okay, and then sort of following on the use of PAM in the agricultural industry and water treatment, um, were there any surprises you found or would you expect any differences for exposure from its global use? Um, so no huge surprises. I mean, we, as Bart mentioned, we've been looking at this for 20 years and we had been relying primarily on the agricultural studies uh, in our environmental impact assessments. The difference here is that we got to go a lot deeper and really confirm a lot of that. Uh, there were some surprises for sure. Um, to me, the whole degradation pathway was interesting. Um, I was under myself, I was under that conception that maybe, you know, you break it, break apart your giant Millennium Falcon and you might get a few Lego pieces. So to me, it was a surprise that you virtually see none of that whatsoever. I'd always thought you might see a little bit. Um, uh, there were a few others. Uh, uh, I guess the the recalcitrance to breakdown of that of that large carbon backbone was a bit surprising. I didn't understand it would be that difficult for microbes, but so I mean it really indicated to me that this is probably even safer than what we had been thinking based on a fairly brief review of the literature early on. Okay, and then a question that's specific to aquatic systems. So is PAM used in non oil sand sectors as a substrate to create sediments in end pit lakes? And can you please discuss the literature you have seen where PAM is used in other sectors to construct aqu aquatic closure features on the reclaimed landscape? Um, it's a good question. I'm not aware of any other um, pit lakes that have been dosed with polyacrylamide specifically for that purpose. However, there are a lot of uses of polyacrylamide in the mining sector. Um, so for sure, there are tailings with polyacrylamide residual in them. Um, and I, I do spend a lot of time looking into pit lakes and sediments, and I've never come across polyacrylamide in any other industry, in any other mining industry. But the reason is, is that most tailings in other sectors are basically just sand, and it's not so much that they need it to settle out, they just need a place to put it and to put a water cover to prevent oxygen ingress. So it's a very different reason that, that say a hard rock mine would put their tailings in a, in a pit lake. It's just, it's a different purpose. Thank you. Um, and then a very specific question. So the degradation pathway as presented here does not identify monomers. And there's a suggestion that it conflicts with other literature. Maybe you're familiar with that reference there. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm pretty sure we would have reviewed it, so I'll, I'll follow up on that. Okay, okay. Um, let me see. Do, do, do. Uh, here's a question about uh, data, and there was another question that I can't, can't actually find now in this um, app about monitoring data. Uh, so this is about presence and migration of acrylamide in groundwater. There was another question about um, confirmation of monitoring data on the tailings uh, deposits. Um, so a question, I don't know whether this was in your scope, I think. It was you, out of our scope, so yeah. I'm going to answer that. So yeah, we did not try and do an assessment of each tailings pond. That was definitely not in our scope. This was a generic literature review, and we, we didn't get into looking at operators groundwater data or anything like that it was just not our scope yeah. uh, and maybe one last one so i'm struggling to understand the differential application of pay, pam to tailings and reclamation in the oil sands compared to agricultural water treatment systems they're, they're quite different applications are there gaps that you've seen through this work that you think need to be addressed no i don't uh so i mean they're definitely different systems but they are uh, the findings that we came across were universal enough across many different types of studies. If, if we had only looked at agriculture, I think that would be a really good question. And, you know, is this applicable to other industries? Uh, but every, every, every type of setting we came across had very consistent findings for everything I presented. So I don't really see any, any big gap there. Great. Thank you very much to both our speakers. Thank you.